Welcome everyone. We'll be starting in a moment, just as soon as Zoom virtually loads all of you guys into the event. All right, it is my privilege to kick off this event, Pandemic Resilience, Work in School. My name is Carmel Shakar, and I'm the Executive Director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. We are co-hosting this event with the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. This event is highlighting the amazing work that the Edmund J. Safra Center has been doing with their COVID-19 response initiative, which is a bipartisan group of experts in fields such as economics, public health, technology, and ethics gathered from around the country, which has released the nation's first comprehensive operational roadmap for mobilizing and reopening the US economy in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. Last week's event was focused on testing and how do we start to reopen the economy. This week's conversation is going to be a little more focused specifically on questions of work, employment, returning to work, and then a question that I think is very near and dear to the hearts of everybody with kids. I know I count myself in that, which is the question of education. How do we make sure that the kids are still being able to learn and return to a school setting that maybe resembles something pre-pandemic. We are very lucky to be joined by a fantastic panel of experts. I'm going to introduce them in no particular order. First, we have Meredith Rosenthal, who is the C. Boyden Gray Professor of Health Economics and Policy at the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We have Sharon Block, Executive Director of the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard Law School, and Mira Levinson, Professor of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So I want to give you a big welcome. Thank you for joining us. Before we launch into the questions, I just have a few housekeeping things for our audience. First of all, I mentioned the Software Center's Rapid Response Initiative. If you would like to read the roadmap or the reports that came out in support of the roadmap, please go there. You can also go to pandemictesting.org for resources. For this event specifically, if you have questions, and we very much hope you do because this is a moderated discussion, and so if there are no questions, it's just me coming up with questions, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom, if you are logged into the Zoom to ask questions, or if you are watching via Facebook, please ask those questions on Facebook and those questions will get to me. Even if I don't ask your question right away, I assure you I'm looking at it, I'm trying to fit in as many questions as possible. Another final thing that I wanna say, I know that we're all hungry for information and I want to emphasize that the event today is discussing what key recommendations for work in school are. Even though the three that we have are some of the leading experts, we want to make it clear that nobody can yet answer specific questions like, when can I get back into my office? My cactus is about to die. Or I would really, really like my third grader to get back to school because I'm at my wit's end. When is that going to happen? Unfortunately, nobody is equipped with a crystal ball, so you can't quite answer questions like that. But we will hopefully give you a lot of context about what is going on there. So with that, we're going to kick off the substantive portion of our discussion. And so first, I want to ask the three of you, how did you come to be involved with the Edmund J. Safra Center's COVID Rapid Response Initiative? Hi, Carmel. I'm happy to start. 
I've had the, the pleasure of being involved with the Safra Center in its initiatives around justice, health, and democracy. And it's a place that has brought people, experts, students, faculty, and others from the community together around complex social policy issues that involve public health. And so through that work, I was also brought into the conversation as the roadmap was launched. And I'm happy to, to go next. So I think it's really indicative of the, the uh, how they cast a really wide net in coming up with this roadmap to ensure that it was really comprehensive and, and different than a lot of maybe the other efforts in that I am not a public health person. Um, but I think they recognize that these kinds of testing, contact tracing, and certainly social isolation kinds of recommendations have really profound um, impacts for the world of work and particularly for the you know, people who are working, starting with essential workers. And so I became involved uh, just to help bring that lens to the recommendation so that that sort of, um, that ground level experience of what these, what these recommendations might mean for workers was kept into the, into the project. Yeah, um, thanks Carmel. Uh, I got into the um, work slightly differently. Um, uh, so I have been directing the uh, graduate fellowship at the uh, NMJ Safra Center for the last uh, three years along with Matthias Face. And um, I'm a fa I was a faculty fellow this year. Um, and so, uh, and I work, do work on education. And in some ways, um, education has very clearly been at the center of this, right? Because as you mentioned, um, any of us who care for children um, uh, are really, really affected by school closures. Um, and at the, on the other hand, it has been fairly peripheral, uh, right? In, in, in that uh, the focus has really been uh, on public health, right? How do we, you know, measure, how do we understand, you know, what do we understand about coronavirus, about COVID-19? Um, what, what do we understand about managing it? How, you know, what do we do about testing, et cetera? And then of course, there's been all this attention to the economy and to workers. And once schools were closed, in a way, like we had ticked that box for a while, but of course we haven't, because again, any of us who care for kids, um, uh it, it's like that bar that it's very present to us that that schools are not uh, that schools are physically closed and even if they are functioning online it's just an entirely different world um so i got pulled into the work or i drew myself into the work really through um uh trying to bring schools back into uh, or thinking about um, them as a pillar of community resilience uh, and uh, pandemic resilience so the first event, as I mentioned, was on testing, and that felt very immediately obvious, the relevance to pandemic resilience. The more we test, the better we know the spread, the better we can contain the spread of COVID-19. Where do you think work and education comes into this idea of pandemic resilience? And this is again to the entire panel. Well, so I guess I, I would just say, um, the way one might look at the goal of the roadmap as distinct from a purely public health approach to the pandemic is the the goal is really to return the economy to functioning and to address the health of the population to suppress the virus. Um, the idea that the only goal of what we're trying to do is this public health goal of, of uh, stopping the spread of COVID-19 ignores the fact um, that we really have much higher objectives here. And, uh, and to the extent that whatever we do on the public health side gets in the way of education and work, we really haven't done the complete job here. Uh, I'll just add, I mean, we've seen a sort of obvious point is that we have seen work be um, an incredibly concerning vector for the disease also. And so um, just even looking at it as just a public health problem, you have to, to look at what's going on in the workplace um, in order to do that. But I also think, you know, especially now a couple of months in, 
Um, you know, and sadly, we had another really dramatic report today on the number of people who have filed for unemployment and you know, with numbers just mind boggling. I mean, as somebody who was in the Obama administration during the Great Recession and watched those numbers come in each week, then uh, you know, we had, we never could have imagined what these numbers would be like. I think you just can't at this point pull apart the public health um, problem and the economic problem and, you know, putting workers at the center of both of those is really important. Yeah, I would add that schools are quite similar, right? Because, uh, you know, one of the very strongest reasons uh, to close, I mean, the reason to close schools is because of schools potential um, as uh, vectors for the disease and particularly troubling uh, sites uh, precisely because so many kids um, who get infected uh, seem to be asymptomatic, right? And so, uh, whereas, you know, at least at the moment, it seems as if their viral loads on average um, are the same as adults. And so, although we don't know for sure yet, the science, you know, doesn't, can't tell yet, but it's quite possible that kids are particularly dangerous vectors in, in that respect if they are engaging in a lot of viral shedding, uh, but asymptomatically. Um, and so, you know, that's the reason that we closed schools. Um, yet, at the same time, uh, you know, one of the reasons that many places were resistant to closed schools for so long is precisely because uh, that itself has such a great impact in a negative way on public health, in fact, right? Kids get um, meals through schools. Uh, many of them get nurses' visits through schools. There are social workers there, right? We know that the number of referrals around um, child abuse um, have uh, cut in half in, in many cities, actually, since schools were closed. And it's not because we think that, you know, domestic abuse or child abuse has magically dropped, right, in this time when we're all trapped with our children together at home under very economically perilous circumstances. Um, and uh, and they, of course, having kids at home makes getting work done much, much, much harder. Even for those of us who are privileged enough to be able to do our work at home, to shelter in place, and yet still do paid work. And also, of course, uh, for essential workers who must leave their homes and do their work physically elsewhere, suddenly having children um, at home 24 hours a day is very challenging. And so schools, uh, are you know essentially part of this conversation and part of the, the of the challenge on the public health side and on the economic and work side. Mayor, I want to pick up on something you said about closing schools raises its own set of public health problems. I think there's been a narrative in this country that the needs of public health are in direct conflict with the needs of the economy and of education. You think about the protests, for example, that happened in Detroit with the picture of the woman yelling at the nurse blocking her way. What does this panel think about that model? Do we think that they're in conflict or do we think that solutions that help serve one help serve the other? I think, you know, what obviously, like what your question leads to is that we want to be able to say, well, of course, they're totally integrated, right? And of course, they, they go in lockstep with one another. I don't think we can really say that exactly, right? Um, I mean, I think it is a little more complicated than that. Um, uh, you know, if we could bring kids back physically to school, um, then we will free up the workforce to work in a way that until schools are actually 100% open, we won't be able to do, right? So like one of the main models I think that's emerging for opening schools up this fall is one that brings kids in for a limited portion of the day, right? So we might have morning session, a deep clean, and an afternoon session with say 50% of kids attending each time. Or maybe kids will come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and Tuesday, Thursday, another week, right? Um, as a way also of just thinning out the number of kids who are in the building at once. Or maybe they'll be on modules, right? They'll be one month on, one month off. There are lots of different models that are out there. None of those models is actually compatible with 
um, all of the adults in the home having full-time jobs outside the house, right? Um, I mean, we have, we still have the problem of childcare, right? Uh, and um, those models are still really worrisome to the many, many adults working in schools who themselves uh, fear being compromised uh, or who live with people who uh, they feel are particularly medically vulnerable. So um, I think these things are somewhat in tension and at the same time, very clearly, like while there are public health concerns, not only are you not going to have teachers who are going to be willing to come to the school, understandably. So adults are going to be wary about coming, but parents also aren't going to be willing to send their kids, right? So Australia, for example, kept their schools open uh, for much, much longer than virtually any other country in the world did. And the teachers were required to continue coming to school, but the parents stopped sending their kids um, because they said, I don't want to put my you know, children at risk and I don't want to put our families at risk. And uh, that I think actually was quite sensible, right? Um, and that's going to continue being an issue. And so in that respect, I think you're exactly right. They do go in tandem because we cannot reopen open schools until we have public health under control. And we cannot get public health under control if we merely reopen um, schools without a plan to manage public health. If I could jump in, I think, you know, there's one actor in this that at least in the economic sphere sort of plays a role in bridging between the public health concerns and the economic concerns, which is the role of government support and social supports. Um, you know, we saw quickly after the onset, um, you know, once the once at least the federal government realized the significance of the pandemic, you know, a huge infusion of support for workers extended unemployment so that people didn't have that tension. Um, you know, I think there might be a perception now of more tension because of concerns that, that those social supports have proven to be insufficient or that they're not going to continue. But certainly for to address a lot of the problems that um, Amira was just raising about, you know, whether workers can be home if schools are closed because of the public health concerns and certainly the, the concerns about, you know, workers being exposed when they do go to work for not certainly not all workers, but for a large segment of workers, some of that can be mediated by having sufficient a, a sufficient government response. And that's very much, you know, speaking only for myself, that seem, whether the government is going to step up and do that or continue to do that seems very much in question right now as we're following the debates about the next relief bill. Right, yeah. I mean, so just to jump in on that, right, if you look at how, say, um, Norway has been opening schools, in part they've been opening schools by having a very serious testing um, uh, tracing and uh, supported isolation uh, model. Uh, so they're testing kids um, every single time they come to school, right? And the kids have learned how to self-test. Uh, and so then you can open schools. So they also do still have social distancing and so forth. Uh, uh, but yes, if we had a governmental in infrastructure and um, uh, implementation in place, then we obviously could move forward uh, on schools as we could move forward with the economy. Well, and the other piece of that is that their parents can stay home without question if they're sick, if the kids are sick, if the parents are sick, and not worry, um, you know, about the economic consequences, yes. <laughs> um, which is something that, you know, we still don't have for the for the majority of people in this country. So I'm glad that we brought up testing because we actually have quite a few questions related to testing. So one of the questions is that there is presumed to be a large amount of asymptomatic spread. And unless there is a high volume of generalized randomized testing with tracing and interventions, i.e. quarantine, how can we truly expect to avoid a rather large and wide outbreak in the fall or even before when we reopen work in schools? I, you know, I would say that um, very clearly, uh, not only the roadmap, but many other policy frameworks for reopening point to the central role of testing and tracing, 
along with um, supports so that people can isolate without, um, without the, the dire economic consequences. Um, and, and of course, for people who may need additional supports because of housing constraints, uh, to make the, the whole picture work, uh, that is really critical. I think whether it's randomized testing or uh, follows the protocols that are, are um, described in the roadmap, However, we look at it is large scale testing is essential here and uh, there's no getting around that uh, in order to be able to reopen without the expectation that we would have a, a dramatic resurgence that would just put us back in the same place with tens of thousands of more deaths. Yeah, I'll add that for, you know, as we think about schools, one of the things that schools did um, in the spring before they all shut down was that we you know, would see schools, individual schools close for a period of days uh, when uh, it turned out that somebody at the school had been positively identified as having COVID-19, right? That was just way too late, right? I mean, uh, it's actually now quite clear uh, that the highest viral load is at the very earliest stages of an infection. Um, and that that seems to be when the greatest amount of shedding takes place. Uh, and so um, it means that in a, you know, a, a close place like a school, uh, you have a lot of transmission that is likely to be able to happen before you end up having somebody who is sufficiently symptomatic then to get tested and then to um, get diagnosed. And so, uh, yeah, I think the only way that we can consistently keep schools open without risking uh, massive second and third and fourth waves, right, um, uh, are by having um, both surveillance testing within communities and then uh, a really careful systematic testing, right, of people, including kids and including teachers and so forth, who are back in buildings. You know, following in many ways the pandemic roadmap. One of the things that my kids have been asking is, uh, so my husband is an infectious disease epidemiologist and they say, so are we past the peak? How far past the peak are we in Boston? Um, and uh, my husband keeps saying, there is no single peak, right? Like there is no magical peak and then we get past it and then like we're all done, right? There is local peaks. We may be past the local peak, but that peak will soon become overwhelmed if we suddenly start interacting again with no, you know, testing uh, and no surveillance and no awareness of who, who is ill. And that's, I think, a really hard thing to get in our minds is that the, that it's not as if they're, once we've passed the peak, somehow then we're out of the woods. So it sounds like there's a need for a very widespread testing to get to the point like in Norway where a kid wakes up, brushes their teeth, takes the test and then goes to school. Do you think that we're where we need to be in terms of testing availability in order to start opening up work, in order to start opening up education? I mean, what we hear, at least anecdotally from workers in essential industries, is that they're, they're coming back to work without being tested, that it's still a matter for the most part um, of workers only being tested, you know, when they're sick, they're maybe having their temperatures taken as they come in. But, um, but we've got, you know, a lot of people who are back on the job or who never came off the job who are not being tested. And that's, I think, why you see these outbreaks, you know, especially in like meat packing and places where workers are, are working very closely together, warehousing. Um, but some of it too is it's very hard to know because a lot of employers aren't being transparent about how many of their workers are getting sick, how much testing they are doing. Um, and workers aren't having a lot of insight into how those decisions are being made. I think in addition to some of those really important context specific facts that Sharon was talking about, I think we can tell how we're doing on testing by looking at the positive test rate that 
you know, we talk about in the roadmap and uh, many states and other governments are following. And so if you continue to get a very high rate of positive tests, that tells you relative to the prevalence of uh, COVID-19 in your community, you're not doing enough testing. And so, you know, we point to that as a, a really critical statistic as we think about the phases of how we address the pandemic is really looking at that positive test rate. So that's a statistic that can help you ascertain, you know, wh uh, whether we're testing enough. I mean, I don't think we have a, a sorry, like, is there, say, even a, a city or an industry um, or a sector of the economy that uh, consistently offers testing even to all healthcare workers on a very, very regular basis right now, let alone say all essential workers who are you know, in that sector? I don't think so, right? So in that case, I think the answer has to be no, we are not where we need to be, right? I mean, that, that's something I think that the roadmap and virtually every other plan that we've seen for how to um, sensibly reopen the economy uh, depends on is having a systematic uh, and norms around testing where we, you know, we'll start to think that it's outrageous that if we're going to um, a, a building and working in contact with other people, especially if we cannot maintain social distance, that we're not being tested, say, every week. Until that happens, no. So I live in Cambridge, where now Cambridge Health Alliance, one of the large hospitals, is offering testing to all Cambridge residents. And one thing that struck me is, you know, you go take the test, but it's not like a pregnancy test. You don't get the results immediately. They turn it around really quickly. I've had friends get their results within 24 hours, but there's still that lag where somebody might take that test and then go to school or go to work. What sort of policies do we need to build in to address the fact that we don't yet have immediate test results? I think that's a really good question yeah. for public health experts. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the answer. <laughs> I don't know if Sharon wanted, wanted to answer that, and I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist either, but, but basically the way the models work, of course, is that we're operating on probabilities anyhow, so there's, um, there's no certainty in the test result, and the lag um, you know, increases the chances that despite having done the testing that um, an infection is passed on, and so the shorter the lag, uh, the better. Uh, because the contact tracing can start more quickly and the chances that the um, virus has spread to, you know, multiple generations uh, of people, as it were, from that will be reduced. And, and so it, that's sort of all part of the math about how this works. But inherently, uh, the, the way we, you know, we understand the world to be, there'll be some lag before someone will get tested. Uh, and then that's really why we talk about the need for not only contact tracing, but for testing those, uh, all of those contacts and then further tracing. And so it's with that, that layered approach that we begin to get our arms around the pandemic. The, the single level of testing and contact tracing is really insufficient to do that. And then again, I mean, just to sort of keep beating the same drum, but then you also need, the law needs to better support um, that reality so that um, to the extent that that in one of in the CARES Act or the, the earlier relief bill, there was a provision for at least some workers to have um, to get paid sick days. Um, but it's been it's been the, the interpretation by the Department of Labor has really not been helpful in in addressing this reality. So if um, if your ability to take paid sick days requires you to have gotten a positive test, then you're going to be, you know, for a lot of people, they're going to feel compelled economically to go back to work until they get that positive test. And so they're, they're, you know, there's an incentive for them to continue to interact in the world um, during that lag time. And so, 
uh, you know, the, the policy behind the law can help address um, some of these, you know, medical obstacles that we have. Um, and, you know, same thing for employers. A lot, you know, there's, there's, I think, been a lot of employers have been slow to adapt their um, pre-COVID, whatever we call that, before COVID, BC policies to address, you know, some of these real challenges. You know, it might have made sense to always require a doctor's note, but you actually don't necessarily want people walking into doctor's offices or you want to recognize the fact that there may be this lag time and it, that might be the critical time um, for people to be home and not interacting. Yeah, the, the one, I, I think I'd add two things. That is also a reason that you want to engage in large scale surveillance testing, right? So that you have an understanding of what's going on in a community and are things rising, are things falling, are they staying the same, right? Because regardless of what you find out about any one individual where there may be a delay, you can, you know, see patterns. It may still be at a, you know, it'll still be at whatever lag the testing results are. You may only be seeing the pattern, you know, at a two-day delay or something, but still that's much better. And so it, it gives you the opportunity to um, engage some things prophylactically, say, if you start to see an increase. Um, and it's also, I mean, building on what Sharon is talking about in terms of uh, making it much clearer in labor law uh, that people should be able to stay home uh, and be paid for staying home if they are sick prior to getting a you know positive test. Similarly, I mean, as I had mentioned, with you know teachers being concerned about coming back to school and parents being concerned about sending their kids to school, right? We need to prophylactically um, plan for how, again, before say somebody specifically has gotten a test, uh, you know, um, for people to be able to make smart choices about their health and their family's health um, with uh, in a way that that keeps them also you know economically whole right and able to continue contributing uh, and able to continue learning and you know and, and being part of uh, a resilient community without that all being on the individual, right? That is part of, I think, the beauty of the roadmap is that it takes a, a systemic and institutional approach as opposed to thinking about a whole bunch of individual decisions by individual people or even individual sectors of the economy. So I will say that question was based on an audience question. So good job audience member for asking a question that initially stumped our panel point to Gryffindor for sure. <laughs> I want to back up to contact tracing, which Meredith mentioned in her answer to the previous question, because we have a thoughtful question asking, what are the legal issues surrounding mandatory information gathering for the purpose of contact tracing? I.e., is it legal for students to, re to require students to install apps for contact tracing as a condition of enrolling in school? be it at the secondary or tertiary level of education. And then I would open it up to, especially for Sharon's expertise, what can employers ask in terms of individuals' health status before allowing them to return to work? Do you want to, I can start with, with, the, with the workplace. I think we're still to some extent, you know, figuring that out. There's obviously um, uh, HIPAA requirements that address to some extent what employers do with health information. Um, I don't know that, that, that there are any sort of blanket protections. I think there's, we're more at a place where we're trying to figure out what are the best policies to um, for workers to be protected while they're in the workplace, but also have those pri their privacy protected. So this is still sort of an evolving, an evolving area. In schools, so I should say I am not a lawyer, and so I don't know the exact answer to the question that you asked. Um, what I do know, though, is that students have remarkably few privacy protections um, it, when it comes to what the school and the school district can know about them. So there are strict privacy uh, protections, FERPA, 
uh, against this, uh, the district's sharing information, say with law enforcement, et cetera. Um, uh, but uh, for example, schools now, um, and they will ever more so actually this coming year, distribute um, uh, what are, must now come to millions of devices to kids each year, right? Tablets, Chromebooks, et cetera. Um, kids who use a school provided device or who use a school provided email address um, uh, can be surveilled virtually, um, you know, ad nauseum by uh, the school in the district. And in fact, every uh, district now has often multiple contracts with surveillance um, uh, companies, right? Uh, that are there in order to uh, protect kids, um, you know, that's the, the idea, right? Uh, protect them from suicidal ideation, um, from if they threaten to shoot up a school, right, from um, cyberbullying. And in fact, schools and districts are obligated by federal law to protect kids from bullying and cyberbullying. And so that's another reason that these uh, protective devices, uh, you know, software is on there, um, because the schools can be sued uh, if this happens using a school provided device or email, even if it is outside of school hours, off of school property, on the weekend, et cetera. Uh, and so what that means is that the mechanisms actually to do, to have this um, uh, tracing app, I think is there. And because every child, at least say above third or fourth grade, is going to have to be provided in, in a web connected device in order to learn this coming year, it will be very easy. I mean, you know, they, be, if these are tablets or computers, they're not necessarily carrying them around with them when they're going to the park or the playground and so forth. So it's not exactly like a phone, uh, but still it has some capacity to track kids. And I think it's going to be legally permissible given the number of other ways in which kids' privacy is um, shockingly uh, not currently of legal concern. So we have two questions that I think pair well together because they're both about what school will look like in the fall and by school I mean universities. So we have one question that asks it, approaches it from the perspective of asking what the panel thinks about whether universities should offer courses in person this fall or go mostly online and inquiring if there's a relevant difference between universities and primary and secondary schools reopening. And then we have another question that I think approaches it from perhaps a more a stronger viewpoint, asking due to the limits of testing and an effective vaccine not available for another year, why not plan on teaching online for the fall? Colleges were able to transform and teach the spring semester successfully if we open schools, we run the real risk of having to close and reopen continuously, which would cause much disruption. So I won't, <laughs> uh, I would not presume to give advice to the leaders of certainly our August institution that's gonna have to make uh, that decision, but I mean, just to offer a few thoughts about like how the decision should be made and hopefully the ways that it is being made is that there are obviously a lot of different interests and a lot of different perspectives um, in terms of what it means to reopen the university. It is, you know, this is, it's an institution that is not just students and professors. There are, you know, a tremendous number of people who work here. Um, and so I think it's really, you know, this is something in my work, we're really trying to promote encouraging employers to get input from the people who work in their, um, in their workplaces about whether to reopen and then how to reopen. You know, there's, there's a certain, there's, it's not really a binary decision, but generally, you know, people who are doing the jobs in a workplace are the ones who know the best about how it's done and probably have the best ideas about how it can be done safely. So it would be great to see a process that really brings a different voices into the decision um, so that, you know, there's just the, you know, there's, there's more, more input, people will feel more invested um, in the decision, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, goes along with what they what they wanted or not. 
Meredith, you were trying to talk, but we couldn't hear you. Can you try again? I think my, I, and I couldn't hear the end of Carmel's question because I think my internet um, uh, slipped out, but I, I, I was um, interested in what you had to say, Mara, but, uh, but it, it seems like the question again goes back to what capacity do we have for testing, contact tracing, and also, um, you know, there, there do seem to be questions that I understand uh, from other experts in terms of the extent to which K through 12 age school children um, mix with the rest of the population versus the extent to which undergraduates, for example, mix with the rest of the population. And so one could imagine decisions being made differently because of the fact that a lot of college students are residential and sort of segregated in, um, in, in those groups versus going home and potentially, as uh, Mara was saying in the beginning, you know, um, shedding virus without having symptoms and, uh, and being a vector for illness in their families. So those kinds of considerations seems like they could have different implications for the different groups. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a fascinating question, and I am more on the side of the second questioner, although I think part of the premise of that second questioner is actually wrong. So, you know, the, the second questioner said, well, given that universities successfully went online this spring, why not continue doing this next year? Um, I think it is true that universities did uh, end up being able to put curricular materials online and they were able to use, you know, say Zoom, Google Hangouts, other means by which actually even to have um, synchronous and face-to-face -face conversations. That does not mean that we managed to successfully provide education to all of our students, certainly not at the level that we uh, you know, know how to give it uh, in person. Partly that's just because, you know, the professoriate is not particularly uh, trained in or good at, right, online education. But it's also, uh, I think, secondly, the reason that um, actually residential colleges and universities have remained pretty strong, even when we've now had online universities available, you know, for now a few decades, uh, which is that uh, the quality of a residential um, college experience and graduate school experience is just really different from the quality of an online uh, experience. There are institutions who do online education very, very well. Southern New Hampshire University, I think, is a really good example of that. But, um, but it's set up to serve a different um, uh, segment of the community, right? Much older students generally, much more mature students who often have a real reason, a, a very clear direction that they're going. And all they're set up also with a huge range of supports, social supports, economic supports, mental health supports, etc. That again, most universities that are set up to be residential may know how to provide residentially. We do not know how to provide them remotely, right? And so uh, there are so many parts of our infrastructure that we know how to do well when we can come visit you in your dorm room, send you to an office, have you as part, right, et cetera, that we don't know how to do remotely, don't know how to do when we're simply not hearing from you, when you're not checking in with us, et cetera. Uh, and we don't know how to teach as well <laughs> online. And there is a huge amount of evidence that show that students um, on average, particularly our most vulnerable college and, and graduate school students, do not know how to learn as well online, right? There's what's called the online penalty. This is also true for K-12 education. Um, so uh, usually it's the most vulnerable students who are having, who have the hardest time persisting in college uh, and succeeding in college when we provide an only online experience because in fact there are immense things around peer supports around professor supports staff supports etc around being in a place where everybody is trying to do what you are doing rather than being in a place where it feels as if you're being selfish sitting and studying rather than going out and earning a wage to support your family, for example. When you're in a place where it's considered, uh, where, you know, having pressure, where, it's con where you get motivation from other students, right? Where, other, where the people you're around with understand the pressure of a deadline uh, and take that seriously, uh, as opposed to, say, the pressure of childcare, right? Which may be staring you in your face if you are at home. There's a whole network of uh, things that help students be successful 
in colleges that are absent when they're remote. So going back kind of to the first question, here I would get, agree with Sharon that uh, the specific nature of the university really makes a huge difference. If it's a residential college or university that houses a lot of kids in dorms, I do not see how they can responsibly open this fall because nobody wants to then see the dorms uh, shut down, you know, catastrophically the way it happened this spring. So, you know, I'm amazed that BC and Northeastern and, you know, other schools have announced that they are opening in person. Um, you know, I think that's immensely optimistic. Uh, and I understand that they're, you know, doing lots of things to give kids private bathrooms, et cetera. But I think it, it's hard to me to imagine bringing people to live together in fairly tight spaces um, if then you're going to have to send them away again. Also, universities that have high percentages of international students, given uh, the travel restrictions, given the backlog on visa processing, you know, visas aren't even being processed, right? Uh, you know, it's, if they are dependent on having international students, I think you have to stay online. On the other hand, if you're a commuter school, right? If you're a community college, um, if you are a regional institution who does a lot of workplace training uh, and vocational education, right? Uh, and if you don't, if you're not bringing in people from all around the world to live together, party together, et cetera, in tight spaces, it may very well be that you can figure out how to offer in-person education uh, at a social distance, right, you know, et cetera. And the nice thing about colleges and universities is if you have to shut down for two weeks, you're not suddenly worried about childcare, right? 22-year-olds can take care of themselves in a way that a nine-year-old can't. And so you can potentially go back and forth between in-person and online education without worrying about who's going to care for the students uh, in colleges and universities in a way that's, again, as I said earlier, much harder in K-12. So as you talked about the need to take care of yourself, that actually relates to a question that we have in the queue, which is asking what work has been done to examine and address the mental health effects of these changes on K through 12 children. So there's a lot of evidence. There was actually a really good New York Times article, I think it was yesterday, on uh, mental health concerns uh, with K-12 kids. Um, uh, and uh, that there are, you know, unsurprisingly much higher rates of depression, anxiety, uh, fear um, that are being diagnosed in kids right now, and unfortunately lower levels of treatment because they're, uh, you know, able to see pediatricians less, etc. Um, there's a lot of talk among K-12 educators, superintendents, states, et cetera, about the need to do trauma-informed education and to serve kids' mental health needs, um, both right now in schools and especially planning for pandemic-resilient schooling uh, in the future. Unfortunately, though, also schools are facing massive budget cuts, um, you know, because of the economic collapse and the collapse in the tax base. And schools have already um, really been underserving kids' mental health needs, then, uh, particularly in large urban districts and in rural districts. The number of guidance counselors to kids is at shockingly bad rates, right? Um, the number of social workers has been way down uh, for decades now. The number of nurses that we have uh, in schools, particularly in uh, high poverty schools serving many uh, kids of color is, you know, uh, it's way below what it should be. When say Los Angeles Unified teachers struck earlier this year, one of their demands was actually to increase the number of school nurses in the districts. It wasn't about their unemployment, it was about the employment of nurses. So, um, there is there are huge needs in schools we i think educators and policy rec makers recognize them and the question is how we're going to find the resources in order to serve kids i'll just jump in i mean the the question was about school kids but i think it's really important also to realize the mental health impacts on adults too and it's really from both um essential like where where the the biggest concerns would be among essential workers who have been under incredible stress 
walking into workplaces that they know put themselves, you know, they were putting themselves at tremendous risk. You know, you see that among, um, obviously among healthcare workers, and there've been some very sad stories about suicides among um, doctors taking care of COVID patients. Um, but you're gonna see this too, I would imagine among like meatpacking workers or other workers who were really been faced with the decision about whether to put themselves at risk or lose their jobs and then lose their ability to support their families. We're seeing a dynamic now where um, even if it's unsafe, if employers are offering workers to get their jobs back as there's more reopening, if they don't take that job, even if they think it's unsafe, they're being thrown off of unemployment. So you have this very um, dramatic choice being made. But then we also, in looking at the economic impact of the pandemic, um, you know, we know from previous um, economic downturns that there's, there's a great mental health toll on workers who lose their job, who are long-term unemployed. Um, and so I think you know, this is gonna be a very widespread problem that hopefully uh, policymakers will take seriously. I want to expand this conversation on the impact of the situation on the most vulnerable to talk more broadly about issues of equity. And we can think about this in terms of gender. I think the audience saw my husband get up to take care of our child, but I've heard a lot of discussion about how work from home disadvantages women who are working disproportionately. Or I think we could talk about it in terms of socioeconomic status. Meredith, I know that your work focuses on health benefits, for example, and people who are in jobs that pay less are less likely to have particularly rich health insurance benefits that might support access to testing and treatment. What are some equity concerns that you would say particularly worry you about the impact that the pandemic has on work or on school? Just since you raised the issue of health benefits, Carmel, I guess I would start there. Um, so, you know, one concern we have, of course, is that people will have differential access to testing and treatment uh, because of their insurance type and how generous that insurance is. And so that's, a, you know, that's an ongoing concern. And because, of course, um, uh, that lack of access has a negative externality. It's a, it's a, that should be a public policy concern as well. And I think we're also, as we are uh, watching the unemployment numbers come in, watching people lose their jobs, they're also losing their employer-sponsored insurance. And uh, so, you know, we're going to be facing a coverage crisis that goes well beyond COVID prevention and treatment. And, uh, and so that will exacerbate uh, existing inequities in health because, of course, the, the people who are most likely to be losing their jobs and losing that coverage are already uh, at greater economic risk. And so, so that's one really critical set of issues here. I, it. There, I think there are two um phenomena that are, are emerging um, and getting more attention that are important when we think about um, the sort of disproportionate impact that, that both the public health and the economic crisis are having. I mean, one on the, on the economic side, 55%, um, I think it is, of workers who have lost their jobs have been women. Uh, so this is a recession that has really hit women um, much harder than it has hit men. There are you know, different ways of looking at the data, but there are, are people who sort of describe this as all of the gains that women have made in the workforce in the past 10 years have been wiped out like in the past two months. And we had a problem with women's labor force participation in this country before this experience. And so there's a lot of repercussions of that, but it's also um, you know, just on a gender equity issue, this is something that's really going to take us a long time and, and, and won't, we won't recover from without thoughtful policy. You know, the other, the other sort of equity um, aspect that, that in my work I've been looking at a lot is the fact the percentage of proportion of essential workers who are workers of color. And that's a specific or especially true among the 
low wage essential workers. And so part of this puzzle as to why the pandemic has been hitting especially black communities harder than others, I'm sure there's lots of public, you know, sort of more medically related um, reasons, but part of it is because they, that they are more likely to be working during, um, during this pandemic. And, and again, if the, if the right supports and protections aren't in place, they're going to be getting sick more. And so, you know, the, again, it's a, it's a dynamic that's going to have a lot of repercussions um, that we're going to have to, to deal with uh, for a long time. Yeah, um, the equity issues obviously in schools are huge. Uh, uh, the Sapra Center uh, put out a white paper I wrote uh, on educational ethics during a pandemic, uh, I guess earlier this week, um, uh, that looked at how um, states and districts are trying to make sense of and address equity issues. What's interesting and kind of encouraging is that in this first few months of um, their responses, everybody actually talks a lot about equity and seems to care about it, right? I mean, it's not just lip service. I think they really do care about equity. Um, the challenging thing though is what that means, right? You know, how do you, um, uh, what does it mean to realize equity uh, around education during a pandemic? So fascinatingly, um, the response of a number of districts and even say of all of Washington state was to say, well, because for equity reasons, because we cannot reach all learners at this time, right? A bunch of kids say, lack uh, hotspots, they lack internet access, right? They lack a tablet, they, you know, whatever it is. They lack a parent at home who can sit down next to them and help them if they're young. Therefore, we should not be trying to provide educational uh, services to anyone. And so they just shut down schooling. Um, they really focused on providing food, which was great. I mean, that clearly is um, a central importance, but they said, all right, so we can provide food equitably but we don't know how to provide learning equitably and hence we should not provide learning. Also, there were legal concerns that uh, because of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, uh, they were concerned that if they were providing education to anybody, they were going to have to fulfill um, st uh, students' um, individualized education plans for those with diagnosed special needs and they weren't sure how to do that online. And so some districts actually thought that they might be legally obligated to provide nothing as well. Um, pretty soon they realized that that level of leveling down, like that approach to equity of just total leveling down was not a good one, in part because it was very clear that if you provide no education to anyone, what's going to happen is the parents who are able to are going to step in and start providing education to their kids. And other parents would really like to be able to do that, but they may not be able to do it as well, right? So th since then, there's been this interesting sort of bifurcation of approaches to equity, where some districts and schools have said, well, we should be reviewing what we've taught and providing enrichment. Right, so uh, projects where you do an oral history with your family or you go out and explore, you know, the park or whatever. Um, others have said, no, equity actually mean, make, that we make sure that kids actually can progress on the curriculum, right? We don't let, want them to be left behind. And so they've gone totally, well, we're going to continue teaching the standards route. These are, again, I think both conceptions of equity, but they push in very different directions. And I think it's going to be really challenging this coming year for schools to figure out, like clearly they're all going to have to eventually get on the, we're going to teach new material, right? And new material that we can count on kids knowing uh, route, but how they're going to do that when kids are dealing with vastly different learning, um, you know, contexts at home when they're going to need to be home. And with say the online penalty of some kids being able to learn pretty well through you know, Zoom, say, and through Google Docs, and other kids really needing uh, an actual caring adult next to them to help them manage their learning, to help them get from one step to the next, you know, et cetera, um, is going to be a really, really hard challenge, and how schools are going to deal with the vast inequities in what kids have learned and lost uh, this semester, and in the traumas that they've experienced. Uh, so, equity is an enormous concern. Um, and I think we're probably going to see 
as many diverse ways of like defining equity and trying to pursue it uh, in the future as we've seen until now, um, none of which are going to be fully equitable, but hopefully which will sort of get at different parts of the puzzle. I think that that was a really thoughtful set of answers to actually bring us to 6 p.m., which is the end of our conversation time. We're very mindful that, you know, people have families, work, other commitments. So we try to stay on time with our event. I really want to thank the three of you for participating in what was a really fascinating and nuanced conversation about the challenges of getting back to work or continuing work, as well as what our educational system looks like right now, as well as what it might look like in the future. So thank you very much, panelists and attendees. Thank you for joining us in this conversation. Thank you for moderating, Carla. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Carla. Okay.